We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm sure the whole Chamber will join me in wishing Paisley well in their bid to become the UK City of Culture 2021. The bid team has run an incredible campaign, and we all wish them well for this evening. Uh, and to ask the First Minister, after yesterday's events, why is the Scottish Government continuing to persist with its named persons scheme? First Minister. Well, firstly, let me also take the opportunity to wish Paisley 2021 the very, very best of luck uh, this evening. All of Scotland is behind the bid. The bid team have done an absolutely fantastic job and I'm sure the whole country uh, are proud of them and will rejoice uh, if Paisley indeed does win the bid this evening as all of us hope that it will. Um, the Scottish Government will proceed with its name person plans for the simple reason that they are in the best interests of children, particularly vulnerable children, across the country. Often when Ruth Davidson uh, raises this issue, she does so from a political perspective. That is her right, the Tories oppose named person in principle. But when we talk about it, we talk about it from the perspective of the protection of children. And I would submit, presiding officer, that is the most important, indeed the only consideration that should drive us. Uh, in terms of uh, the committee decision, there have been concerns expressed at and by the committee uh, about the draft code of guidance. The draft code of guidance is exactly that. It was always intended to be illustrative. Uh, and of course, the Deputy First Minister has committed to working with practitioners uh, to develop the final code of practice. He has also established a practice development board uh, panel that will be led by Ian Welsh. And of course, crucially, has committed to giving this parliament the final say on the draft code of practice. So uh, we are disappointed with the committee decision. Uh, we think it is unnecessary to delay at stage one, although we recognise that and will now work with the committee and the Bureau in terms of the timing. But in the meantime, we will go on with the important work of developing that code of practice because I will end uh, this answer where I started it. It is about the protection of children. Uh, this bill is not about the principle of named person. It's about the information sharing that is necessary to ensure that vulnerable children don't fall through the gaps in services. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, we all want to protect vulnerable children, but after yesterday's events, it's clear that this is not the way to do it. So let's run through the timeline here. The original legislation was passed in 2014. It was ruled unlawful by the Supreme Court in 2016. The Education Committee of this Parliament has said it can't provide a report Order, because of please, the lack of clarity on how changes would work. And now we're told it won't be until late 2018 before the Scottish Government can even provide a satisfactory code of practice. So far, the only people who have benefited from this mess are the lawyers who have coined in over £800,000 in legal fees. Given that record, does the First Minister honestly think that this policy can be salvaged? Yeah. First Minister. Well, firstly, I think Ruth Davidson should be very careful not to inadvertently mislead because she said that the Supreme Court said that the named person policy was unlawful. As anybody who uh, reads uh, the judgment, uh, the principle of named person uh, was said by the Supreme Court to be benign and legitimate. The Supreme Court made uh, a number of uh, pronouncements about the information sharing provisions and it's those information sharing provisions uh, that this bill is intended to address. And of course information sharing is vital, uh, it is vital uh, as part uh, of efforts of those working in the front line to protect children, particularly uh, vulnerable children. In the words of Social Work uh, Scotland, it, uh, information sharing is vital to getting it right for every child. Now, Ruth Davidson has asked me about the timeline, and I do think it is uh, a bit rich for a, a party that has sought to politically undermine and delay name person at every juncture, and is now supporting a committee decision that would further delay the introduction of named person to somehow criticise this government for it taking too long yeah. to be introduced. So we will continue to do what we said we would do, which is work with practitioners uh, through the new panel that has been established on the final code of uh, conduct the, the, and give Parliament the final decision on this. I would lastly say 
Uh, Ruth Davidson says that all of us are concerned uh, with the protection of children. I certainly hope that that is the case. But if that is the case, then I would hope that all of us would pay attention to what those on the front line working with vulnerable children say. And a whole range, a whole range of organisations, notwithstanding the concerns that I concede they had about the draft uh, code of guidance, uh, a range of organisations called on the committee to pass the bill at stage one so that that continued work on the code of, of guidance could be continued. I think that's a sensible way forward, but we will continue notwithstanding uh, the developments of yesterday to develop that final code so that we can go on with putting in place measures that are fundamentally about protecting children. Yeah. Ruth Davison. Officer, the weaknesses of this policy have been exposed by the lengths that the government has gone to to try and prop it up. And the Deputy First Minister has already been forced to apologise over the failings in the new bill. And we've now discovered that witnesses to the parliamentary committee have been lobbied by the Scottish government in advance of their appearance. And the government says that this is entirely innocent, which is OK. So if there is nothing to hide, Will the First Minister publish the minutes and the attendees list of these private meetings with the committee witnesses so that we can all see what's been going on? Yeah. First Minister. Well, look, if Ruth Davidson is seriously standing up in this chamber today suggesting that a government taking through legislation on an important issue like this one should not seek to engage with and talk to about their concerns uh, with organisations uh, like Aberlour, like Children's Health Scotland, like One Parent Family Scotland, like Enable Scotland, like Social Work Scotland, then I think Ruth Davidson is demonstrating why she should never be anywhere near government in Scotland. It is our duty. It is our uh, duty as a government to listen to the concerns that organisations like that have and seek to address those concerns. And it is on the basis of those discussions that the organisations such as those that I've read out uh, have said that they think the committee should pass the bill at stage one to allow the Scottish Government to continue to work with them to address their concerns and finalise uh, the code. I think that's the sensible way to proceed. And if this is about the protection of children, uh, rather than political point scoring, then I think that's the way all of us should be determined to proceed. Let's put children at the centre of this yeah. debate. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, it's usual that organisations lobby government, not government that lobbies yeah. organisations. Yeah. But what the First Minister isn't understanding is that the policy is a mess and it's only her and the Deputy First Minister that can't seem to see it. Everybody, everybody wants protection for vulnerable children, but it's now clear that Parliament has joined the public in no longer having confidence in these plans. We should focus resource on those who actually need it, rather than having blanket interference for every family in Scotland. We are willing to get round the table to find a fresh solution for this, but first, the First Minister needs to ditch this broken plan, because her named person policy is in tatters. Can she simply concede that so we can all move on? First Minister. Well, let me explain uh, the difference between uh, the Tories and this government when it comes to engaging with stakeholders. Uh, yes, uh, stakeholders lobby the Tories when they are in government and the Tories ignore them. Uh, Organisations lobby this government and we respond and seek to address the concerns that they have. That is how responsible government operates. Now, Ruth Davidson says this should be about reflecting uh, the opinion, not just of parliament, but about people uh, outside of parliament. And I think we should pay particular attention to those who do uh, work on the front line with children and particularly vulnerable children. So I am uh, about to read out uh, the second paragraph of a letter signed by uh, Children in Scotland, Aberlour, uh, the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, uh, Action for Children, the Institute for Inspiring Children's Futures, Crossreach, Social Work Scotland, oh, Children's Health Scotland, COSLA, Includem, one Parent Family Scotland and Enable Scotland. And this is what this letter 
from all of these organisations said, uh, this is a letter to the Education and Skills Committee, we are writing to ask you to approve the bill at stage one in order to allow time for the Scottish Government to demonstrate its commitment to making improvements uh, to it and to the proposed code of practice. That's what those working on the front line with children want us to do. And I think as a parliament, we should listen to them and respond. Absolutely. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Investment in the arts and culture can be a pathway to economic regeneration and employment, but it can also lift the horizons of the people. So can I take this opportunity to also extend the support of the Scottish Labour Party to the people of Paisley in their bid to be the city of culture for the United Kingdom? Of course, the bid has been initiated and led by the local council. And, presiding officer, last week I asked the First Minister if Scotland's 32 councils will get the over half a billion pounds of funding that they need just to stand still to maintain local services. But I received no answer. <laughs> presiding officer, austerity is not an abstract concept. It means real cuts to real local services. It means the closure of breakfast clubs. It means the acts falling on holiday activity programs for children with disabilities. In the real world, it means cutting teachers for children who have additional support needs. How can the First Minister possibly justify those kinds of cuts to local services? First Minister. Well, Richard Leonard asked me uh, last week what the budget would have in store for local government and I uh, said to him last week that he would find out uh, in two weeks time when Derek Mackay presented the budget to this parliament. Uh, I can update that answer uh, today. Uh, he will now find out, find out in one week's time when Derek Mackay presents uh, the budget to parliament uh, one week today. And what I, can tell, what I can tell Richard Leonard is this, that just as we have done in previous <laughs> years, uh, this government will do everything that we possibly can to protect frontline services from the impact of Tory imposed austerity. Uh, we face in the coming financial year uh, a cut to our day to day spending uh, in real terms of more than £200 million uh, imposed by the Tory government uh, that Richard Leonard still prefers. Uh, to have control over these issues than he would prefer it to be uh, a government in this parliament. But I, in response to Richard uh, Leonard last week, also pointed out that the only councils for this financial year that hadn't taken the opportunity to maximise their revenues uh, through the council tax were Labour-led councils. So if Richard Leonard is concerned about the kind uh, of services that he has talked about, then perhaps he can address that point now. Why is it only Labour councils that this year are not using every penny at their disposal to protect frontline services? Richard Leonard. Well, uh, presiding officer, I have to report to Parliament that these cuts to children's services, which I listed, are not just being planned by any council, they are being planned by the SNP on Falkirk Council. And they were discussing it just yesterday. And new figures published just last week show that 39% of children in Falkirk live in material deprivation. Meanwhile, meanwhile, this SNP council is planning to cut to the bone childcare, is planning to close down breakfast clubs is planning to act teachers for children with additional support needs. So the question is this, does the First Minister believe that if she fails next week to properly resource councils, to properly invest in local services, that we will see this material deprivation faced by Scotland's children go down, or will it go up? First Minister. Uh, not just protecting the health service, uh, protecting as far as we possibly can local uh, services. We're investing further amounts of money uh, directly in our schools through the pupil uh, attainment fund and we will continue to do that. And when the budget is 
published uh, next week. All councils, uh, whoever uh, leads them, will be able to finalise their own budget plans. And uh, when Richard Leonard and others see the budget next week, they will see evidence of a government continuing to protect frontline services where it matters most. Uh, but Richard Leonard still hasn't addressed the point. If it is uh, his position that he thinks local government are short of cash, then why are Labour councils not maximising the money that they have to spend. But the final point I would make is this. If Labour want to have a proper constructive discussion, it's about time they brought forward some concrete proposals. Richard Leonard wrote to Derek Mackay uh, late last week uh, about the budget. There wasn't a single figure in the letter, not a, a single concrete proposal about what should be spent and how that money should be raised. So Richard Leonard wants to be taken seriously, then actually engage in a proper constructive discussion, and then we might start to take them seriously as well. Richard Leonard. Thanks, Presiding Officer. And one of the things that uh, too many children living in material deprivation miss out on is a new winter coat to keep warm. Yesterday, I visited the cottage in Kikodi and had the privilege of meeting with volunteers, including a selfless group of pupil volunteers from Balwiri High School. They were sorting out parcels for needy families for Christmas, winter coats, scarves and gloves to be delivered to families who are living in abject poverty. This is the reality of Tory Britain and it is the reality of SNP Scotland. It's it's a... Uh... Order, please. Order, please. It's the it's Dickensian Scotland, where too many families... It's the Dickensian Scotland, where too many families are forced to turn to food banks. A Dickensian Scotland, where school children, school children are dispatching emergency parcels to help their classmates at Christmas. First Minister, if cuts to children's services are imposed by you, you are not standing up for Scotland, you are failing the children of Scotland. So will, so will you use the powers? Will you show the political will? Will you stop Tory austerity in its tracks and protect the funding of these vital services, yes or no? First Minister. Well, when when Derek Mackay sets out the budget a week today, uh, what he will show uh, are the actions of this government will show stand in stark contrast to the empty rhetoric of the Labour yeah. Party opposite. But poverty, poverty and child poverty in particular uh, is an issue of, of the utmost seriousness. The Joseph Roundy Foundation, of course, uh, published a report in the last couple of weeks that showed that poverty is lower in Scotland than it is elsewhere in the UK, and that child poverty has fallen faster and more sustainably in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK. But my view is a very simple view. As long as one child uh, is living in poverty, that is one child too many, and we have got more work to do. That is why this government uh, has recently legislated for statutory targets on child poverty, making us the only administration in the UK now to have statutory targets. It's why we have established uh, our Poverty and Inequality Commission to advise and to challenge the government to go further. And of course, it's why in the programme for government, we outlined our intention to set up uh, a new tackling child poverty fund. Uh, I could list a whole range of uh, other areas from council tax reduction to free school meals and a whole uh, host of other policies from this government uh, many of them, many of them happening in Scotland and not happening anywhere else in the UK about tackling child poverty. And we will continue uh, to show the priority we attach to that through not just our budget, but every single policy we pursue. Thank you. We have a, a number of constituency questions. The first from Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister may be aware that yesterday the Fife Rape and Sexual Assault Centre uh, took the difficult decision to close their waiting lists. Uh, this service the organisation provides is a vital lifeline to women and to men across Fife who have been the victims of sexual violence. Does the First Minister agree that Fife Council must ensure that the funding provided to the Fife Rape and Sexual Assault Centre is maintained? First Minister. 
Uh, yes, I, I would certainly hope that that is uh, the case. I'm uh, happy to also ask the Justice Secretary to look into this and to see whether there is more the Scottish Government uh, is able to do. Services like this are absolutely vital in protecting the most vulnerable women and children in our country. And I hope all of us, uh, whatever political disagreements we might have across this chamber, uh, could come together and support the work that organisations like Fife Rape and Sexual Assault Centre uh, do uh, for the benefit of all of us. And Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that the Western Isles Integration Joint Board is carrying out a review of dental services on the US, which could leave pa some patients facing a 60-mile round trip to visit the dentist. Currently, if a health board implements a service change, the Scottish Health Council can determine it as a major service change and can refer it to Scottish ministers. However, I understand it has come to light that the Scottish Health Council has no formal jurisdiction to rule on IGIB matters and therefore cannot make a determination that would enable this service change to be called in. This means that any such proposals from an IGIB board can go ahead with no scrutiny from Scottish ministers. Will the First Minister impose a moratorium on such issues until this loophole can be closed? First uh, no, it would not be right to impose uh, a moratorium on the work of local uh, integration boards. Uh, they have a duty to get on uh, with the work of, of designing and improving services for the local populations. I will, however, ask uh, the Health Secretary to write to the member. It is my understanding that the, the Health Council uh, can decide to involve itself in advising integration uh, joint boards about matters such as this. And of course, any integration joint board would be expected to fully consult with its local population uh, on any proposed service change. So I will uh, ask Shona Robinson to, to look at the detail of this uh, and respond to the member as soon as possible. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Will the First Minister join me in congratulating Paisley 2021 Bid Director Jean Cameron and her team in all their endeavours to get Paisley to this stage of the City of Culture 2021 competition? As everyone will be aware, the winner will be announced tonight. And will the First Minister wish the Bid team and the great town of Paisley all the very best of luck? And we look forward to them bringing the title back to Scotland. First Minister. Well, I think Today would not have been complete without George Adam getting to his feet to do what he does best and, and stand up for Paisley. But uh, I said earlier on, of course, uh, I and I'm sure all of us across the chamber uh, wish Paisley 2021 every success uh, this evening. Jean Cameron, the bid director, I think has done an outstanding job, but everybody associated with the bid, formally and informally, those uh, who have backed it uh, have been awesome. So Paisley deserves to win uh, this bid. So let us all uh, root for Paisley for the remainder of the day and uh, hope that it has the success it deserves when the results are announced later this evening. And Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be delighted to hear that performance on the Waverley Line has recently improved. However, I have received complaints from constituents in the Scottish Borders regarding overcrowding when no additional carriages were put on despite a predicted increase in demand. Would the First Minister agree with me that every passenger on the Waverley Line deserves a seat no matter what time of year? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I'm glad uh, to see the improvements that have been uh, made. Uh, however, if there are still improvements that require to be made, they have to be taken serious. If the member wants to write to me or uh, perhaps more appropriately to the Transport Secretary uh, with any concerns that have been raised by constituents, I will make sure that that is responded to properly. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, add the support of the Scottish Green MSPs for Paisley in their bid for the City of Culture and congratulate everyone involved in the bid? This week it was confirmed that rail fares are going to see their biggest increase in five years and those who commute for work at busy periods will see a 3.6% increase from next month. And that's alongside the overcrowding, the delays and the daily problems that rail users experience across Scotland. Does the First Minister accept that this is simply an unacceptable situation? And does she agree with the findings of research by Commonweal and the TSSA that under a public operator, if the money currently being extracted from the system for private operators' profit was reinvested, we'd instead be seeing an average cut in fares of 6.5%? 
First Minister. Well, firstly, I uh, absolutely understand that people do not want to see any increase to uh, rail fares. I think we can all understand that. It is important to point out, though, that uh, regulated fares uh, in Scotland uh, will increase by uh, under the rate of inflation and, of course, increases in Scotland will be below the average uh, rise reported for England and Wales, meaning that Scotland will have the lowest level of fare increase uh, in the, the UK. It's also important to point out that uh, fares fund a lower percentage of uh, the total funding for railways in Scotland than is the case elsewhere in the UK. The Scottish Government funds 55.5% uh, of the cost of the Scottish rail industry. That compares uh, with the UK government, which funds only 34% of the cost in uh, England. It's also, I, I think, fair to point out that ScotRail's performance has continually improved over the last year, resulting in it becoming the best performing large train operator in uh, the UK. In terms of a public sector uh, rail bid, Patrick Harvey uh, is aware that uh, we secured the right for a public sector operator to bid for the next franchise. Uh, we did that uh, after that was repeatedly denied uh, by successive Labour and Conservative uh, governments. We uh, certainly welcome the TSSA report uh, because we too recognise the social and economic benefits to be derived from a publicly run uh, railway. Uh, so that's why we committed in our programme for government to enable a public sector body to bid for future rail franchises and of course work to ensure that is underway. Uh, the final point I would make though is that rail franchising and competition uh, policy are still reserved matters to the UK uh, government. Neither a, a direct award of the contract nor full renationalisation is currently uh, possible due to uh, the legislative constraints of the Railways Act 1993 which is reserved to the UK Parliament. I know Patrick Harvey will agree with me that all of these powers should be devolved uh, to the Scottish Government but I hope he can help us persuade other parties in this chamber that that should be the case. Patrick Harvey. I'm very glad the First Minister welcomes this report uh, and I, I think it's unacceptable that people should be seeing a, an increase in their fares when we know that a cut in fares would be possible under a pub public operator. And I, I welcome the fact that there's some appetite for this and I think that if this was brought to the Chamber, the First Minister would find that there is a very strong majority across this Chamber for a public sector operator. Our railways have been run for profit for over 20 years now and in that time we've seen public transport fares relentlessly go up while high carbon modes of transport have become cheaper even though the Scottish Government wants to make them even cheaper with their tax plans. But investment is needed too. Our analysis shows that the Scottish Government's capital spending is far too dominated by high carbon projects. Reopening rail lines and stations would be a hugely positive way of redressing that balance. There are examples around the country which could be taken forward quickly and easily, like the Leave and Mouth line. Will the First Minister commit the Scottish Government to backing our proposals for low carbon infrastructure, including these obvious, quick and easy opportunities to improve Scotland's railways? First Minister. Well, we'll always look favourably uh, at good ideas, but of course we have our own plans for low carbon uh, infrastructure. When I set out uh, our programme for government back in September, it was of course uh, described by environmental campaigners then as the greenest programme for government in the lifetime of this parliament. Uh, so that commitment to the low carbon transition in transport across uh, other sectors of our society will be reflected not just in that programme but in the budget that we present uh, next week and we will continue to take the steps to support uh, what needs to be done to secure that transition whether that's in uh, transport whether that's in our energy sector or across a, a range of different sectors and I look forward to continuing uh, to have environmental campaigners consider uh, us to be uh, the greenest government in the lifetime of this parliament. Question number four Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. It was supposed to be buccaneering Brexiteers striding the globe, but this week we witnessed the pitiful reality. Halfway through her soup, Theresa shuffles out of a Brussels lunch, red-faced because Arlene has told her no. The Conservatives are weak, split from top to bottom, in hock to the DUP. But the good news is that the Servation poll at the weekend showed a majority of people in Britain want the power to reject a bad Brexit deal. They don't trust the Conservatives and the DUP to decide what is good enough. Will the First Minister join me and support a public vote on the Brexit deal? First Minister. I think the Prime Minister fell into her soup uh, <laughs> rather than being 
uh, halfway through her, her soup. I, I think this week, uh, this Tory uh, UK government, I say Tory UK government, strictly speaking, it's a Tory DUP uh, UK government, has been shown to be uh, dissembling, mendacious, uh, and totally and utterly incompetent. Uh, they are not just leading this country over a Brexit cliff edge, but they seem determined to do so blindfolded. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've seen a more incompetent uh, UK government in, in my lifetime, and really that is saying uh, quite <laughs> something. I think, I think the, priority, the priority now, in my view, uh, has to be uh, unite those who uh, think that the most common sense compromise option now is for the UK as a whole to remain within the single market and the customs union. Uh, I believe if Labour was to get its act together, if Jer Jeremy Corbyn was to get his act together, I, I believe that position could command a majority in the House of Commons. So let's try and unite all of those of that opinion to stop these incompetent, reckless, ideological Tories taking the UK and Scotland with it off a Brexit cliff edge. Really, really. But, but surely the best way out of this is to give the British people the final say. I mean, last week, the Conservatives agreed to pay billions when the NHS were expecting £350 million a week. On Monday, the shambles of the Irish border. Yesterday, the chaos of David Davis. And next week, the deadline of the European Council. And the Cabinet haven't even discussed what kind of trade deal they want with Europe. If the Conservatives can't trust themselves to decide, then why, why should we let them? Surely the British people should decide what is best. That's why now is the time. The First Minister can help build the momentum for a new vote across the UK. She can persuade others. Labour's Sadiq Khan is on side. Businesses are outraged. The public mood I think is changing. Will she help us build that campaign? First Minister. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, how selective Willie Rennie is in his support for second <laughs> referendums. <laughs> but, you know, in all seriousness, uh, that, I think, is a, a decision for later. I've said uh, publicly before, and I will say again, it may well be uh, that the case uh, for giving people across the UK another opportunity to have their say on the issue of Brexit becomes difficult to resist. But I think there's a more uh, immediate necessity, and that necessity is to stop this reckless UK government driving the entire UK over this cliff edge. And I think the majority exists in the House of Commons if Labour gets its act together, and I think the majority exists across the whole of the UK to stop that happening. Uh, the sensible compromise option and the best option, uh, or at least the... the, the least damaging option for our economy is to stay within the single market and the customs union. So uh, everybody uh, who is of that view should come together and now make that happen. Uh, I think the real lesson, though, for those of us in Scotland uh, around this whole debacle is this lesson. As long as we continue to allow our future to be in the hands of Tory governments at Westminster, rather than having our future in our own hands, we will also always be at the mercy of reckless decisions taken by Tory governments at Westminster. The sooner we're in control of our own future here in Scotland, the better, and this week has proved it. And a couple more supplementaries. The first from Anas Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, President Donald Trump made a frankly dangerous decision to move the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It is now clear that under his leadership, the US cannot be seen as an honest broker for peace. And in actual fact that he is a threat to a just settlement, to a viable independent Palestinian state, and to wider Middle East peace. Will the First Minister add the voice of the Scottish Government and urge the UK Government to add its voice to the growing consensus in the international community of the Pope the UN Secretary General, the EU and our NATO allies, including Germany, France and Turkey, in condemnation of President Trump's decision? And will she resolve to work right across the UK for us to urge the international community in our world of chaos to make the case for Middle East peace? First Minister. 
Uh, yeah, yes, I will. I have uh, already condemned uh, Donald Trump's decision on behalf of the Scottish Government and I am glad uh, to see that for once the UK Government has also already uh, condemned that decision. Uh, the decision that uh, Donald Trump took uh, on Jerusalem, and let's remember that Jerusalem, Jerusalem includes occupied Palestinian territory. That decision uh, was reckless wrong and a real threat to peace in the Middle East and that's why the decision has rightly been condemned across the international community. Uh, the status of Jerusalem should be determined in a negotiated settlement between Israelis and Palestinians uh, and ultimately of course uh, Jerusalem should be the shared capital of the Israeli and Palestinian states uh, and that I think is an important principle. I do think uh, yesterday's uh, decision, as I say, was reckless and wrong, uh, but it does threaten peace in the Middle East. Uh, I think it is incumbent on all of us to condemn uh, that decision, to work even harder to secure peace in the Middle East, and even at this late stage, call on Donald Trump to think again. And Ivan McKee. Uh, reports this morning show that fewer patients in Scotland are waiting more than four hours in A&E than they did five years ago. In Tory run England, the number of waiting has doubled. Can I ask the First Minister what investment is our government making in our health service to ensure that it continues to improve? First Minister. Well, this gives me the opportunity to do what I hope all of us across this chamber will want to do, which is to thank everybody who works in our NHS because uh, the figures that Ivan McKee uh, has just cited in this chamber are to the credit of those who work so hard in our emergency departments and others uh, across our NHS. Uh, these figures show that long waits uh, in accident and emergency departments in Scotland have reduced over the past few years uh, by 9%. In England, they have gone up by 155 uh, that is a tribute to the hard work uh, of those in our accident emergency departments. This government will continue to support them through record investment in our National Health Service. We've increased the budget of our health service during our time in office by around £3 billion. And next week's uh, budget will underline uh, continued investment in our National Health Service. Question number five, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is tackling knife crime. First Minister. There has been a sustained long-term reduction in violent crime in Scotland over the past decade. This includes a 59% fall in the number of people admitted to hospital due to assault with a sharp object, uh, and that's the equivalent of almost 800 fewer admissions in a year. Uh, alongside enforcement of legislation, we've invested more than £14 million in violence prevention since 2006-07, including almost £9 million for Scotland's National Violence Reduction Unit and funding of over £3.4 million for the No Knives Better Lives programme. Much of our effort has been focused on young people in schools and local authorities are supporting us in the implementation of wider strategies to prevent knife crime. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. A decade ago, knife crime in Scotland had doubled under Labour and the Lib Dems. However, since 2007 under this government, the number of people carrying knives has plummeted by 69% from 10,110 to 3,111, while in North Ayrshire the fall is a heartening 77%. Between 2006 and 2011, 40 young people died in homicides involving a knife, falling to eight in the following five years, with thankfully none so far this year. And England, Wales, 2017 looks set to become the worst year for knife deaths in a decade, according to the Guardian's Beyond the Blade report, with 35 deaths so far. Does the First Minister agree with a thousand more police on our streets compared to a fall of 20,000 down south? Scotland's communities are safer than for 43 years and commend Police Scotland, Medics Against Violence, the Violence Reduction Unit and No Knives Better Lives campaign for the enormous contribution they have made to this historic success and will she encourage authorities elsewhere in the UK to follow Scotland's approach? First Minister. Well, I certainly agree that these figures are extremely encouraging. Uh, there is still a way to go before we can finally put a stop to the culture of violence but the decline in knife crime in Scotland over the last decade has been dramatic. And I'm sure that across the chamber, uh, members will join me in paying tribute to the work of Scotland's National Violence Reduction Unit uh, and also to frontline police schools and NHS workers who are driving this positive trend and who are challenging the behaviours uh, that have held us back in the past. This success is due uh, to a range of policy interventions. Uh, and I do think it's fair to say that other administrations across the UK perhaps could learn something from our experience. Liam Kerr. 
presiding officer. Uh, in October, we revealed that almost half of councils do not collect data on the number of knives found in schools. In response, the First Minister promised to take action to make sure that they do. What progress has the government made? First Minister. Uh, well, we are uh, making sure that uh, there is progress uh, on this. I'll ask the Justice Secretary to write to the member to uh, update him uh, precisely on what uh, is being done. But, you know, making sure that we have the data uh, around issues like this is part of the work we require uh, to do uh, to continue to see progress in reducing uh, knife crime and knife incidents. But I think... It can safely be concluded uh, from the figures that uh, we've just been talking about here that the policy interventions that are being undertaken in Scotland are working. Uh, so we must continue to make sure that we pursue them vigorously. Question number six, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to improve the availability of organs viable for donation and transplant. Uh, we're continuing to work with NHS staff to increase numbers of donors and transplants available in Scotland. We will also be introducing legislation in this parliamentary year to bring forward a soft opt-out system of organ and tissue donation. Over time, as part of our wider package of measures to promote a culture change in favour of donation, this should help to increase the number of deceased organ donors further. Jamie Green. I uh, thank the First Minister for that response. It is an issue for me, uh, like many, which holds great personal resonance. I was blessed with the gift of a, a, grandmother, a grandmother, thanks to a kidney donor in the 1980s, and also of family members who passed at an early age, but through donation gave the gift of life and health to others. However, a report this week uh, released by the Welsh, Welsh Government found that despite the implementation of an opt-out system for organ donation, the number of donors has not increased in the two years since it came into force. So can I ask what steps the First Minister will take to ensure that any such scheme in Scotland takes into account any potential issues around availability, eligibility and family overrides, whilst addressing any other concerns that the public might have with plans for opt-out in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I think, uh, I think these are important questions, actually, very legitimate questions. Uh, the early indications from the Welsh system are, are mixed. There are very complex factors involved in donation, donor numbers fluctuate and the evaluation uh, report in Wales suggests that a longer period of time is needed to draw firmer conclusions about the impact of the change in the law. So we will continue to learn from the experience in Wales and indeed from other countries that have already adopted an opt-out system uh, in order that we can deliver a workable safe system here in Scotland. And I think it is important that we take the time uh, to get this right. Uh, I think there's two quick points I would make. Firstly, uh, we have seen an increase in donations in recent years between 2007-8 and 2016-17. Deceased donor numbers in Scotland increased by 140. Uh, percent, and I think that's something uh, that all of us uh, should welcome. Uh, when, I, when I was Health Secretary, and I, I came at this issue from uh, having a long-standing instinctive position in favour of moving to a softer opt-out uh, system. In my various discussions with transplant surgeons and others, uh, they persuaded me uh, that we shouldn't rush to make that change, that it was actually more important to do what they described to me at the time as the hard miles of this, putting place uh, the infrastructure uh, that would support an increase. That's what we spent a lot of time doing. That's what's behind the increase that I've just uh, cited here. Uh, but having done that, I do think it is now time to consider that move, and that's what the legislation will allow Parliament uh, openly and responsibly to do. And in doing that, of course, uh, we should pay attention to what's happening in Wales and indeed to other countries as well. Question seven, Tavish Scott. Also, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the EIS's opposition to plans to disband the independent General Teaching Council for Scotland. First Minister. Well, we're currently consulting on the establishment of the Education Workforce Council for Scotland, which would take on the functions of the General Teaching Council for Scotland. The Workforce Council would create a national system that ensures the full range of practitioners, not just teachers, have the skills and expertise required to do their job effectively. The consultation makes clear that we intend for this body to operate independently from Scottish Ministers. A strategic working group has been established with representation from the General Teaching Council for Scotland to consider the full implications of establishing the Education Workforce Council and we will consider all responses to the consultation when it closes on the 30th of January 2018. Tavis Thank you. Does that mean that the, this body that is being proposed would be independent of the Scottish Government and all its educational agencies? 
Why has the government not carried out any legal, financial or risk assessment of these proposals? And will yet another discussion over educational structures help narrowing the attainment gap, gap the professional learning and development of Scotland's teaching profession from Stranraer to Shetland? First Minister. Well, let me just make a, a number of points. Firstly, we're consulting on this at the moment. As I said er earlier on, uh, the consultation doesn't close until the end of January next year. Uh, and uh, we will look at the consultation responses uh, reach a final decision and then do whatever uh, work is required after we've taken that final decision. I said in my original answer, and I would repeat here, uh, the intention would be for this new body to operate completely independently from Scottish ministers. I, I appreciate there will be a range of different views on this, and I think it is important that we uh, debate them openly and frankly. But, you know, let's uh, be mindful of what underlies uh, this. The education workforce has changed significantly in recent years. There are now a number of professionals working within education uh, that are currently not required to register with the GTC. That includes classroom assistants, uh, additional support need auxiliaries, teaching and support staff in the higher education sector, uh, school library staff, for example. So this is about making sure that for everybody who works uh, in our schools with children, uh, we have the appropriate arrangements in place. So uh, let's uh, take it forward uh, in that way. And of course, uh, we will reflect on all the points that are made in the consultation and of course from members in this parliament. Thank you very much. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Alexander Stewart on brain tumour awareness in Scotland. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats. <laughs>